Welcome to Hard Talk. I'm Stephen Sacker. How do we judge the health of our economic systems? Well, it's about far more than those headline numbers on joblessness and growth. My guest today is the Nobel Prize winning economist Sir Angus Deaton. He has focused on what he calls the deaths of despair attributed to suicide and drug and alcohol abuse, indicators, he says, of a sickness in the American economic model. And now, of course, we have the coronavirus pandemic as well. So has a fundamental weakness been exposed in capitalism? Sir Angus Deaton in Princeton, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be back. Let me ask you a simple question. You are one of the world's renowned economists, and in your latest work, you have focused very much on death and mortality rates. Why have you done that? I've always believed that um, you know life is about much more than just money, and I've interested throughout my career in well-being, um, in what makes people tick and what matters. And, you know, having money is not worth a whole lot if you don't have a life to enjoy it with. So mortality um, is, you know, a key component of trying to assess a much more complete picture of what it is that's happening to people. You talk of a complete picture. The big picture, according to several sort of political scientists, stroke economists, the big picture, if one looks not just across the developed, but the developing world as well, is a mortality story which is profoundly optimistic, that uh, the longevity of the human race is rising and that we've frankly never had it so good. And yet your work, which is very specific, seems to suggest in America in particular, that's not right. Well, um, you and I are obviously talking about pre-COVID, so you know maybe we'll come back to that. Um, but yeah, um, and that was why what Anne Case and I found when we started this work in 2013 or so, when we discovered that death rates were going up um, it, for midlife people and middle-aged um, white Americans, um, that we were just astonished. I mean, you know, we were doing something else. We were pulling down these data. Um, we looked at these numbers and we just couldn't believe what we were seeing. And it couldn't possibly be true because of what you just said, that, that we'd had a century um, of mortality decline and what in goodness name was happening. And, you know, our first thought was it can't possibly be true. Uh, because it was happening, people would be shouting this from the rooftops. But, you know, it was true, and it was a major reversal from what we'd seen for 100 years of progress. As you say, we need to address what is happening with COVID-19 as well. But before we get to COVID-19, just explain to me, uh, as you dug into the data about mortality rates, particularly, as you say, amongst midlife Americans, particularly poorer white midlife Americans, uh, you began to uncover what you called the phenomenon of deaths of despair. And I want to know exactly what you mean by that phrase. Well, you know, it's really just a convenient tab. But just to go back to when we were first looking at these data, if we discovered that this mortality, which had been declining for 100 years, has suddenly stopped declining, the first thing we said, well, what what in goodness name is it? And, you know, we'd already, the reason we found it is because we were working on suicide. And so we knew that suicide rates were rising quite rapidly in midlife. Um, and so we went to see what are the other things that are rising very rapidly. And the other things we found were drug overdoses and alcoholic liver disease. And, and these all have a sort of element of suicide about them. I mean, I really don't want to say that drug addicts want to die. They often don't. But it's sort of drug addiction, abuse of alcohol, um, suicide are all sort of things that you're doing by your own hands. So that was why it was actually Anne who came up in a press interview with the notion of deaths of despair as just a label 
um, to put the three things together. And it really has caught off into the public um, discourse. It's become one of these terms that has a life of its own. But um, uh, and let me and stop you just for a sec. Does that necessarily interest you as an economist? What if that is simply a phenomenon that is the result of the uh, overprescription of a new kind of drug, at least new to many Americans, that is the whole range of opioid drugs? Wouldn't that make it just a, a temporary blip rather than a structural phenomenon that you as an economist would be interested in? Well, um, you have to ask the question as to why why did this overprescription of opioids only happen here? And, you know, why isn't it happening in Britain to anything like the same extent? And why is it happening in Germany or France at all? So there's a real question of what is it about American society, about the American economy that really causes this to happen? The other thing that's very important is when you said poorer white Americans, it's not really poorer white Americans, it's white Americans without a bachelor's degree, without this four-year degree. So we were immediately in this thing where here's this economy. It's just not treating these people who haven't got a four-year college degree very well. Not only that, but it's unloosed these pharmaceutical companies on them to make a huge amount of money and to propagate an enormous amount of misery and destruction among those people. What kind of scale of extra death, if I can put it that way, are you ascribing to this phenomenon? Well, the last years in which we have data are 2017 and 2018, and there were 158,000 deaths of despair um, in each of those two years for which we have data. That's more people than have died of COVID-19 in the US so far. Um, COVID-19 may well exceed that. These are very, very large numbers. They're not all excess because after all, there's always some suicides. There are going to be people who die from alcohol poisoning and so on. Um, and we reckon that normally runs at about 60,000 a year. So it's killing about 100,000 people a year. And, you know, one of the analogies we use in the book is if you take a Boeing 737 fully loaded and it falls out of the sky, killing everybody on board, three of those every day is about what we're talking about here. You know, these are big numbers. They are very big numbers, but as you've just indicated, we're getting used to potentially even bigger numbers with the scale of the COVID crisis, not least in the United States. That's Your right, came... except that COVID is going to stop, we hope. Ah, um, you know, well, either the virus will go away, as Donald Trump likes to say, or we'll get a vaccine or we'll get a medicine to deal with it. So, you know, let's say in this year we lose 200,000 Americans. Um, you know, we can pray and reasonably hope that that will not go on into the future. But the 158,000 deaths of despair shows no signs of diminishing at all. So is there any relationship at all between the way COVID-19 is impacting America and the particular groups within America it's hitting hardest and the groups you've identified as being most vulnerable, most impacted by these so-called deaths of despair? Yeah, I mean, that's a really, really interesting question. And we spent a lot of time thinking about that. So one of the things that's clearly happened with COVID is there's been this division between people like me um, or like you who can sit at home and work or work behind the screen and you continue to get paid and you run very little risk um, of catching the disease. Um, they typically tend to be more educated people um, people with um, desk jobs um, and so on. Whereas the people on the other end, the essential workers or the key workers, um, you know, in many cases have to risk their lives um, and they are more likely to be less educated people. It, it's not a perfect match because obviously there are doctors and healthcare workers who are pretty highly skilled. But, you know, the people who are working in retail stores, the people who are working in meatpacking plants and food retail, all that sort of stuff, um, those people are relatively poorly skilled. So the less than college educated people who were hurt by deaths of despair are hurt again um, by COVID-19. The one group that's different are African-Americans here. And until about 2013, African-Americans were not subject to any of this, um, the deaths of despair. Um, though after 2013, there was a sort of epidemic of fentanyl in the inner cities in the eastern United States, which turned black mortality up. But African-Americans have really been suffering 
disproportionately during COVID-19 in America, as indeed has been the case in Britain, I believe. Yeah, I, I want to get to the African-American experience in greater detail later, but I, I just want to be clear here what you're actually saying, because as I said at the very beginning, you're one of the world's renowned economists. That's what you do. You are not a health specialist, and yet you seem to be making a very direct correlation here between uh, the national health, that is the health of the American people, and economic conditions. And in essence, a lot of it seems to be about people in low paid jobs, in poverty, with lower education. No, it's not. Think? It's I, I, That's not right. It, it take, it's right until you said the word poverty. We have no evidence that these people are in ah. poverty. And in fact, poverty so this is in not, the United this is States not about is predominantly African-American, and those people were doing pretty well until recently. So this is not a poverty thing. Um, it's That's not part of the story. It's less educated thing. And we, we're not tying it in any very simple way to economic conditions. Because if you look at what happened after the Great Recession in 2008, um, deaths of despair were rising rapidly before the Great Recession. They rose at the same rate during the Great Recession. And they rose at the same rate after the Great Recession. Nothing to do with the Great Recession. So the story we're telling is a much slower disintegration of the life of working class America, a life that was built at the end of the 19th century, thrived in mid 20th century, and has been coming apart ever since. And we tell a sort of Durkheimian story. Um, you might say, what are economists messing with Durkheim for? But you know, Durkheim really got this right, um, which is if you're living in a well, world where meaning is evaporating, then self-destruction is a real risk. My reading of, of the book, Deaths of Despair and the Future of Capitalism, is that if there's any one target of your anger right now, it is the American healthcare system. And when you talk about the disintegration of the lives and culture of working class white Americans, it would seem to me you put a lot of the blame for that at the door of America's private healthcare system. Am I right? Yes, you are dead right. So what's to be done about it? <laughs> well, there's lots of things we can do about it. It's just very difficult to do them because it's so well protected and fortified against criticism and against change. But the, the nuts of the story is that it costs far too much. It costs twice as much as any other health system in the world. It delivers lousy outcomes. And it's financed by what is essentially a poll tax on workers. And so, as we've said somewhere else, it, it um, has taken a wrecking ball um, to the labor market for less educated people. Is that another way of you, uh, as an economist, blaming capitalism? Because, of course, capitalism underpins the American healthcare system. It is a private system. It is for profit. And there are very big profits to be made. Are you saying capitalism simply doesn't work in that context? In that context, which is in the case of delivering health care. I mean, you know, Britain's a capitalist country. You don't have a private health care system or you do, but only as a marginal um, thing on top of the National Health Service. No other country in the world, no other rich country in the world tries to run its health care as a private market system. And, it, you know, it's a very important thing to realize that one of the greatest economists of the 20th century was Ken Arrow. And, you know, Ken Arrow was the guy that proved the theorems, the Adam Smith theorems about how capitalism works and how capitalism is good for you and when it's not good for you. And the really important thing about proving those theorems was you need to figure out what are the assumptions to make it work. And the assumptions to make it work do not apply from healthcare. And we do not have a competitive healthcare system. It, it's riddled with um, all sorts of rent seeking, with government interference. The government interference is not there to protect patients. The government interference is there to protect profits. And yet, and yet uh, if I may say so, Sir Angus, when Americans are consulted about whether they want a truly, let's call it socialized, as many of its opponents do, socialized healthcare system where the government, in essence, organizes and runs the system and the profit motive is taken out of it, Americans by and large say no, that's, that's not what right. they want. Well, there's two things there. One is the word socialized has become demonized in America. And secondly, you don't have to have a socialized system. And Britain has a socialized system, but France doesn't, Germany doesn't, Switzerland doesn't, Holland doesn't, Canada doesn't. There's lots of options for it to choose from without the government delivering health care. And 
you know, that's a perfectly soluble problem. We do not have to have a system in which the government employs the doctors and nurses and runs the hospitals. Yeah, Britain's pretty unique in doing that. Let me come at this from a slightly different angle. You, you for a long time, you know, and you're writing about uh, inequality and healthcare outcomes and all sorts of other things. You, you've made it plain that you're an opponent of the way America currently does things. But there's a whole raft of other thinkers in America, political scientists and economists, who say that you're barking up the wrong tree, that ultimately this isn't so much about economic systems, it's about moral values. And that the modern day 21st century America is unfortunately, as they would put it, full of people who lack the moral fiber to make the right kinds of decisions and that that is the fundamental failing of today's America. I don't think that's true. Um, you know, th there certainly are deep sociological moral issues that are really important, like especially ones associated with family formation, um, especially the consequences of um, the availability of abortion and of the um, contraceptive pill. Um, where there really have been changes in social views of, um, you know, childbearing and out of marriage and living together without a marriage. I, I, the I, I, if I may say so, sorry, because aren't many of the... the labor force because they become lazy is just totally violated by the data. Right, but I'm just looking at a, a quote from, from Philip Cohen here, who's done lots of research on this. He says that what you refer to as the, the phenomenon of deaths of despair is directly linked to the uh, the fact that marriage, uh, and particularly he's talking about amongst white people, uh, marriage isn't the institution it used to be. Uh, and that women in particular have changed their behaviors and their attitudes in ways that many women would welcome and say are very important, but they have fundamentally changed the way society works and the way the economy works. Well, I, I agree with a lot of that, and we say that in the book. Um, but, you know, <laughs> I don't like this idea that somehow they decided, they got up one morning and decided we're not going to behave ourselves anymore. <laughs> and there, there were actually external things that made that very important, you know, so that the, the availability of contraceptive pills and the availability of abortion um, sort of changed the responsibility for childbearing, um, for conception, um, from um, men who'd had it before towards women. And for some women that worked really well. You know, what, what it, it drove a wedge so that for people, women who were really well educated or could be well educated, it opened up an enormous avenue of opportunity that they could really now go to college, they could choose when to have their childbearing, they didn't have to choose between education and having a married life. But for less um, educated, less talented women, that's sort of been a disaster. So, well, but, you know, but, but isn't that, isn't that uh, the, the problem in a way that I, I don't want to sort of put words into your mouth, but I would guess you characterize yourself as a liberal and a progressive, but it seems to me in a way, the message that you are delivering that, you know, the, 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 the white communities of America are experiencing forms of despair because of the decline of family, community and religion, that is a message that could be taken by some of your perhaps ideological opponents as a defense of their conservative values. Well, you're, you're characterizing me. I'm not characterizing me and I don't accept that characterization. Um, one of the things that I've tried very hard to do is to not label myself and to take the best from all particular things and all particular lines of thought. And, you know, I don't think it's all um, that change in taste or the loss of industry or the loss of virtue. And you have to keep in mind, and this is very, very important, that these bad things are only happening to people who do not have a four-year college degree. And the third of whites who have a four-year college degree are doing great, thank you very much. Um, and so if it's a general decline in virtue, why does the decline in virtue only happen to the people who are less educated? And it's because their world has collapsed around them and they've lost meaning. And, you know, I don't care where you attribute it. And, you know, a lot of what we blame in the capitalist system is the degree of rent seeking in America. And, you know, that's very much a right wing buzzword. And I'm all for it. Mm. I, I want to just come back quickly to the issue of what is happening to black Americans. You've pointed out that they are disproportionately disproportionately impacted by 
COVID-19. We, of course, live in this particular time where there's much focus on the, the whole Black Lives Matter movement. And yet, of course, your work is very much focused on what has happened to the white ordinary working man and woman. So given recent events, do you think perhaps big picture, we should be focused much more still on the systematic discrimination faced by black people in America than this sort of deaths of despair phenomenon hitting white people? Absolutely. Um, I agree with that. And, you know, in the book, um, what we explain is that the phenomenon that we're concerned with in much of the book, which is these deaths and despairs among white Americans, had already happened to black Americans, you know, 40 or 50 years before. So this is like the other shoe dropping. Um, and, you know, that's not an exclusively white phenomenon. If you were a real anti-capitalist on the left, which um, perhaps you think I am, but I'm not, <laughs> the, um, you would say that what the capitalism does it's discarding the workers, um, unnecessary workers, starting from the least skilled who were, you know, in the 70s were African Americans, the inner cities, and has now reached the um, least skilled whites, which are whites without a BA. And, you know, in the end, it's going to come for all of us. I, I don't think that's true, but you can certainly tell a story. So we don't think of this as a white story. And it's certainly true that African-American mortality rates have consistently been higher than white American mortality rates. And so if you're asking where is the injustice in mortality, certainly among African-Americans. I mean, one of the things that's interesting about Britain is you have this excess mortality from COVID-19 among what do you call them, BAMEs. Um, but prior to that, the mortality rates for um, black English people um, were lower than for white English people. That was not true here. Donald Trump, from the very beginning of the COVID crisis, made a point of saying that he feared that if America lived in a prolonged lockdown, the health impacts and the death and the mortality as a result would be far greater than that caused by the virus itself. In a funny sort of way, given your work, do you have a little bit of sympathy with that view? None at all. It's just wrong. Um, you know, what I said earlier that... Um, during the Great Recession, um, deaths of despair were going up before, during, and after, and there's no sign of the Great Recession. And we've been watching the data very carefully to see if there's signs of a big increase in drug overdoses to suicides. We only have very partial data, but it just doesn't seem to be happening. It might be happening. We don't know yet, and it'll be a while until we know. But, you know, Donald Trump was pushing that in order to try and get people to go back to work even when they were scared. And I have very little sympathy with that, and there's no basis for that argument. Uh, and a final thought. Uh, you, uh, in the book, talk about the future of capitalism. You don't talk about the failure of capitalism. But is that really what you feel you're addressing today, particularly in this healthcare sector, but perhaps more widely, because you do talk a great deal about uh, the, the ways in which inequality is problematic and that some people in America are making vast amounts of money while the, the majority are uh, suffering stagnant or declining living standards. Is this about the failure of capitalism? No. And, and, you know, in the book, we say we considered that as a title and we rejected it because we think for the mass, most part, capitalism has been a huge success. And failure of capitalism is just we want to replace capitalism by something else. I don't know what. Um, whereas future capitalism means we need a future in which it gets fixed and these terrible things that are destroying people's lives um, are put right. Sir Angus Deaton, it has been a pleasure to have you on Hard Talk. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you too. I enjoyed it.